All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thanks, everyone, uh, for, for coming out. And thank you to Justin and Jessica Arman for being here with us. Uh, Justin and Jessica are the founders of uh, Parents for Liberty. And Justin has authored a guide for Liberty Me members uh, entitled Free Your Children, A Guide for Liberty Loving Parents. And the guide, it, it skips past the usual parenting manual stuff about perfect kids and gives you the advice you really need on the nitty gritty of real life with children. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Justin and Jessica. Hi, thank you for that introduction, Matt. Um, so I thought that I would have my wife on because she's very much my teacher. <laughs> and we're doing this as a partnership. And she thinks about things that I forget all the time. And it was, it was in a sense, it was spiritually a co-authorship because this is a path that we're on and a lot of these principles we've learned together. Hey, baby, that's yeah. sweet. <laughs> so we're parents of three children. Um, we're business owners. We've been, we've been uh, entrepreneurial and uh, creating family businesses for, I would say, about five, no, seven years now. Mm -hmm. So we've met our needs by creating businesses. Um, we created an organization called Parents for Liberty, and we have annual education events, um, alt education events in Austin. We try to bring parents from all over. And uh, last year, Larry Reed, Lawrence Reed of Fee was our keynote. It was, a, it was an amazing event. We had Michael Strong and a, just a powerhouse lineup. So uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've pretty much become extremely uh, passionate about education, uh, homeschooling, We've, we've uh, done a lot of inner growth, and we've had to fight for our family. So um, Frank in the chat room was, uh, I could tell, being a little tongue-in-cheek, uh, asking us what our credentials are. And I'll tell you, our credentials are, um, you know, we've, we came together as a family. Um, things were really great, and things quickly fell apart business-wise. So we have struggled through highs and lows. We've had our children... Um, the courts come in and almost break our family apart because our lifestyle is unconventional. Um, so we literally had to fight for our family, which is something that very few people actually have to do anymore. They kind of things come together and you're together because of circumstances uh, and, and you very rarely have to fight for each other anymore. So we've done that. Uh, we've almost lost our marriage. We've had a fight for that. And, um, and we've, had to, we've gone from establishment parenting, being totally plugged in and doing what the status quo told us we should do, we were, and, and to completely unplugging and reinventing the wheel altogether. Um, so that's our credentials. Life is our credentials. We are not, um, I don't have a master's in education. Jessica doesn't either. Um, we are pretty much autodidactic. We've realized that Homeschooling has actually reinvigorated our own love for learning, so I'm very much a student. In fact, I just took a course uh, with my 14-year-old son. We just did the college seminars together, the fee college seminars in Austin, and I look at my children as kind of my, my study partners, so we're in this together. Um, but we've, had, we've gone from one complete conventional outlook to um, reinventing the, our, our approach to what education is, what the parent-child dynamic is, and we've just done a lot of soul searching. And we're still doing that. To, you know, We still have a lot of growth to do. And I think that along the way that we've learned a lot and um, the, the way that Parents for Liberty was born was we wanted to have support and we wanted to have community and also to, to have somebody that was a little bit further along the path than we were to kind of guide us and go, hey, maybe this would work for you or this won't. Um, we've tried it just to also to have that sense of community. So um, that's really what we were offering. It's not not like we're the know-it-alls that that we have these these big credentials and listen to us. We have all the right answers, but just a hey, take this journey with us, and and we've learned some stuff that might help you, and you have um, some information that will, I'm sure will help us on our path. So it's more about community, I would say. Yeah, so with the liberty.me guide culture, with a lot of the subjects, it's, um, you know, the team is looking for experts in certain fields, and, and uh, I, I'm definitely not writing the guide because I'm an expert parent. 
um, I'm writing the guide because I feel like um, our experience is uh, something that others may relate to and uh, and that's it. So we're not parenting authorities and we're not going to offer these universal prescriptions or say that our way is the one right way. And I would actually um, encourage you and, and offer a little advice to probably steer clear of the people that that are saying that they're, they're authorities in parenting. And or that, that there is one right way because right. that's one thing that that I think that is a gem that we've learned is that every child is different, every parent is different, every household is different, and it's it's really important to check in with what it is that um, you are all creating together and and guide your decisions and guide your actions and your your speech um, according to what you want to create and and what is best for your children and best for yourself. Right. So there are universals. There are objective rights and wrongs. Uh, when we're talking about libertarian philosophy, objective rights are any actions that really don't harm anybody else. And objective wrongs, wrongs mean that somebody's been hurt in their person or, you know, and property. So I like the universality and the, um, the definition involved in right and wrong in a libertarian sense. So in principle, there is a right way, right? The non-aggression principle is I would say universally right. Um, however, in the home, there is uh, diversity because there are, there are so many things that make the dynamic uh, change and variable that uh, really the exercises is looking within on a on a foundation of principles, um, having a solid trajectory of what you want to create, and then and then um, building something unique and original together. So diversity is what we want, and diversity terrifies the state, which is why there are institutions um, to homogenize the mind. Because when you can homogenize the mind, you can control the trajectory or the machinery of state, right? Um, so uh, what we're trying to encourage in our message and in my guide is, um, is uh, diversity, diversity of experience, diversity of expression, and really um, stepping outside of your comfort zone and killing the status quo altogether, unless it's working for your family, which mostly it isn't. I would say commonly uh, the status quo hurts families. Um, so it's, it's all about personal expression on a foundation of universal principles and, uh, and, and moving forward from there. So, so the guide covers our pursuit from, uh, from the time period that we realized that we wanted to come from a place of, of, uh, of what am I trying to say here? If, so there was contradictions in our yeah. lives. So we had, we were solid libertarians. Um, I say that we were kind of hobbyist libertarians in the book because libertarianism was a part of our conversation and our intellectual uh, pursuits and our love, but our lives were out of alignment with our principles and we were essentially walking hypocrites. Uh, both, yeah. And it, and it caused a lot of... Um discord and drama and weird um, happenings in our daily lives because it, it, we weren't living our, our each moment or we weren't living each day in alignment with our principles. Like we knew certain things were wrong. We knew certain things went against our core beliefs, but we weren't doing anything about it. So it caused a discord between um, us as our as our partnership and it caused a discord between us and our children and um, once we realized that I didn't want to live like that anymore and my husband didn't want to live like that anymore we decided that that it was time for a change so that was when we really took a step backwards and we we kind of took stock in our lives and what was it that we wanted to create what were our principles um, how do we live by our principles? What's important to us? And and this whole new world um, started to take shape, and it was really really exciting. And we learned a lot, and we grew, and we started um, like kind of relaxing a little bit, and the drama started to shed away from our daily lives. And I think that almost immediately, I felt a closer bond to our children. Right. Um, because I wasn't allowing the state to come in between me and um, and and them. Like so, we we have a, an ask an ask for an example. So 
one of the, the biggest things was homework. Our children would go to school and they would come home and we would work on their homework and we would get so frustrated um, because they didn't want to do it. You know, they fought us and we became the bad guys. We didn't, we didn't know a different way really at that point. So, you know, even trying to show them a different way than what we, they were being taught uh, freaked them out and we would fight and we would get upset right. and uh, it, it just, it was too much. So, so specifically, um, the kids were in a, in a learning environment that we knew was destructive. Um, so, so I, I don't like to make universal comments like, you know, public school is bad. I think that inherently public school is a violation of the non-aggression principle because it's based and funded by, by uh, taxation. But um, if you, I don't like to make those statements because a lot of people that are involved in those institutions are actually uh, advocates for children and they, yeah, they love well children and they love learning. Yeah. However, in our hearts, um, I, I studied what the history of uh, public school actually was from its Prussian roots and Spartan roots and, um, and I realized that a lot of the moves in public schools were, not, were constraining teachers to not actually allow them to teach. You know, a lot of teachers say they're there for their children, but then they're too, fear, they're too scared to move outside of their rule book. If they do something different, they get fired or they, they get ostracized or they, you know, a lot of times they get put in the hot seat. So they can't do what they originally want to do. Some do, but our children's experience um, was, we could tell, very destructive. So they would come home, you know, they'd have math homework, and, um, and I... I that I could figure out ways and teach them ways to do things and maybe three steps that they, it was taking them eight or nine steps and, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of decontextualizing and um, they, there were a lot of things where they weren't seeing the connections between problems. So they were just basically uh, doing the steps and memorizing steps without understanding the steps. And when, when I would go to teach them or help them, it would end up becoming a fight between us and a struggle between us because they knew that if they did it a different way that they were actually going to be punished in class or made fun of or they would get a bad grade and they, um, they were just absolutely terrified. I mean, to a point where they actually would shake or they would say, you know, I can't do it like this, but I can't do it like this rather than, wow, there's, you know, <laughs> there's another way to do this. And, and it's really about um, the edification of understanding how to solve problems efficiently. It, be, it didn't become that anymore. But even though we knew about um, public school and it was not in alignment with what we wanted for our own children, we were still taking them there day after day, feeling guilty, and a lot of times actually taking our guilt out on them. So they would mm -hmm. come and they would tell us the bogus history and the lies that they were learning in school. I mean, outright lies and actually things that, that um, blew my mind that they were getting away with teaching. And, um, and I would argue with them, right? <laughs> so instead of, instead, of, instead of understanding, hey, this is my responsibility, I put them in this situation, there's a teacher there that is supposed to be an authority in their eyes, like that's the teacher, why would that teacher lie to me, right? And, and it became this, this conflict and contradiction and, 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 and it drew us apart from our children to a point where they didn't want anything to do with us anymore in terms of their education because it always led to fights. And the homework was so overwhelming and the schoolwork was so overwhelming that we realized we were only getting maybe a couple hours a day of authentic time. And with our busyness, really maybe only 15 or 25 minutes if we checked in, if we really checked in. And school was completely taking over our lives. And for us, and our home, it was out of alignment altogether with our principles and what we wanted for our children. But it was the fear and the 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 cowardice and the um, the mediocrity and the uh, procrastination and all of yeah, that sort I of thing. Yeah, I would say it was it was also easier. It was yeah. easier. We had a lot of of stuff going on, and and even though we really wanted to create something different every day, waking up and and just saying, oh, not today, like the. The procrastination is is exactly what it was. It was just it was so much easier just to go here, go to school, and it, that'll give me some time to work on this mm -hmm. or do this or whatever. And um, I felt really like uh, I, I don't want to say hatred for myself, but it, it almost got to that point where I was I would just 
dump all this drama on my own shoulders like I'm not a good mother I'm doing something that's against what I believe is is good for my children and I'm not saying that public school isn't good for some children but I know for a fact from watching our two oldest who were in public school at the time go through this like degradation and they it just I knew better I knew better and I still took them so it, it just caused a lot of conflict in our lives and there there were other things um, uh, one more example before we move on to some uh, things that we've learned that we'd like to cover before we open up to, to um, this Q&A um, is just the way we were handling the parent-child dynamic right so what is virtuous in a in a libertarian world and in a world of of strong autonomous sovereign individuals uh, we were squashing because it was inconvenient for us at the time so strong headedness and um, holding uh, the children trying to self-govern or um, holding to their principles of right and wrong or that sort of thing when it became inconvenient for us we would punish them for it or we become authoritarian and we would say things like you know just do it because I told you so or mm -hmm. or you know you have to understand that we're the adults here and you're the child even though I w we were completely that was intellectual bankruptcy there is adult and child dynamics that are um, you know uh, a good and healthy but that's that's not an argument that it's not the reason for this is not because we're the big people and you're the small people that's that's completely fallacious and it leads to intellectual bankruptcy and it stops uh, it stops the mind from from using reason and we were using force um, as a means to an end and that's not what we were uh, trying to teach our children we can't go oh well now you're this size and this arbitrary age so now it's not okay uh, to use force or it's not okay to accept aggression from certain people just because they wear a badge or because they call themselves the state like if we program that in them we can't expect that program to completely come undone without a significant amount of inner reflection and 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 growth um, when this when you're programmed by the state but then you're trying to hold on to libertarian principles it's like a cognitive dissonance that's fighting with each other and so we had to check in with that so I want to move on to the Q&A and I hope I hope that was good uh, Travis as a couple of examples for you right now I don't want to ignore our, our chat room but what we've learned as um, and what is captured in this guide that I hope that uh, you all will read um, it's you know you could probably read it in a few hours but uh, they're pillars pillars of, of what we've learned and uh, things like things like the like libertarianism um, they are prescriptions for how uh, in, in a macro sense so like in how how society should be governed a, a sort of um, legal foundation it's and it's a vacuum right it's the non-aggression principle we should not do this um, which is beautiful in a macro perspective because it's basically saying I don't know what's good for you let's let what works converge and uh, sort of emerge spontaneously into these beautiful diverse things that no intellectual could ever foresee right we want to get rid of uh, central planning and just let people be individuals and and let the best kind of come through right but in a home the non aspects of a philosophy aren't enough right so uh, you can have a perfect uh, perfectly libertarian home and you can have you can be perfectly libertarian but you can still be an asshole you can still be uh, genuinely uh, like the kind of person you want to run from. You can be a crappy father, you can be a crappy mother, you can be a crappy kid, but you can still be perfectly libertarian, right? So um, what we've learned is what we want to transmit. Um, and I, I don't want to call these things objectively right, even though it's my opinion that they are because they've worked for our family. But uh, just take them to heart. Maybe if you disagree with something, bring it up in the questions or... Uh, just leave it. But if you think find things that you agree with, then you can uh, you can take them with you potentially and, and put them to use. So one of the the pillars, if if would you like me to start on this or yeah, do you want to go please, ahead? No, no. Please interrupt me if you, if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the the pillars is um, being conscious in the home. So all, everything that we're going to speak, I would say this is a foundation. This yes. is really this is the the true building block on which everything else that we've learned works. If you don't have this one pillar um, really solid 
in your daily life, then the other things can kind of get skewed and it won't work as well. So right. this is really what we found is the most important thing in trying to create um, a joyful, peaceful life with our kids. Absolutely. So all the things that we're going to be speaking about as foundational are things that you can actually apply daily and know that you've done them. They're measurable in a sense. So co being, uh, being committed uh, to being conscious in the moment in your relationships that you're creating is personal responsibility. So that's doing personal responsibility, is being conscious. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is when you're, when you're having a dispute with a member of your household, your children or your partner, um, or if you're just uh, expressing your feelings about something, you can build bridges of empathy and you can use uh, what has been called the third way of listening, which I talk about in, in the guide. And bridges of empathy are like this. Um, you can basically, become, you're on the same team, right? So even though you're disputing, even though you're taking uh, contrary views or you're in a dispute or you're, you're not agreeing upon something, you can totally um, hold, uh, you can hold their argument, but you don't have to fight against it and you don't have to agree with it or disagree with it. In fact, when you're disagreeing, usually you're missing a bunch of what they're feeling, what they're um, trying to communicate, and it becomes a you against them scenario when, in fact, you love that person, right? You love your partner, you love your children. So to say, to have the intention that you don't want to get through this together is like a miss. You know in your heart you want to get through this together. So you're on the same team, right? So it becomes you against the problem. It's you and your child or you and your partner against the problem itself. The problem can be, um, you know, the cleanliness. The problem can be uh, just the fact that you're not maybe showing your partner, you're not giving your partner what she or he needs, uh, right? There may be something that's inequitable. Uh, you may be not be fulfilling your commitments with the person. So you take the problem and then you put yourself aside. And then when you're hearing it, even if it's completely wrong, you can sit with it, right? So if you, if you judge without observing, judgment without observation is, is the epitome of ignorance. And that's a lot of times what's happening in, in disputes, right? Um, but if you can actually take and you can observe everything, uh, and you can fully empathize with it and build that bridge between you. Don't agree or disagree. Just be with that, um, with with what your uh, partner or your child is telling you. And you can fully understand it. Then you can build that bridge and you can fully understand where they're coming from. And then you can take a position as well. And you can say, look, I've heard everything you have to say. I love you. I'm pissed off at you right now. But... I'm, I'm really working hard to understand this because I want to get through this with you. And now here's what I have to say, right? And then if you've noticed that there is like bobbing head or no, that's, that's right, or you're doing this, you're closing yourself off, what you're doing is you're playing games. You're trying to win the game. And that's totally zero sum. And that's not what, is, not what a household should be created from. Uh, what a household should do is like when these conflicts happen, it's an opportunity to come together. And that sounds a little airy-fairy, but it, the fact is, is that conflicts are, and, and how you get through conflicts is what's going to build that bond, right? So if you can work on that, um, my friend uh, Daryl Becker, he does a lot with empathy and um, uh, that sort of work. And he calls uh, responsibility your ability to respond. And I think that in the home, it's a real beautiful thing. It's mm -hmm. just absolutely beautiful. That, to me, in your communication and the way you handle yourself is doing personal responsibility. And I think that on top of that, another thing that, that a lot of people, um, a trap that they get into is taking offense to what's happening. And if you come from that standpoint of, okay, Justin and I have an issue, so we're going to be on the same team and this issue, we're going to tackle it together. So anything that he says, um, I know it sounds totally bizarre to some people, but um, I don't take personal offense or I try not to take personal offense to what he's saying because I understand that, you know, I love him and when he's happy, I'm happy and our home is peaceful or, or with our, our children, it's the same thing. They can be totally upset at something that I've done and when you try to listen without, uh, without judging at first, it's very difficult to not take 
personal offense, but if you can practice um, and and just let it go and really hear what's happening, um, you will see that first of all, you got to sing the Frozen song now. Come on, let's <laughs> let it go, let it go. <laughs> um, you you get to resolution a lot faster and. One of the things that we've taught our two oldest, especially because they're in the age where we can really reason with them, is, is that if you're with somebody and you love them, don't just automatically create, a, like, don't go, okay, I've been dating you for six months, we're going to get married. You, you really see who a person is by how they handle the tough times. And Justin and I, like he said before, we've been through some really tough times. And instead of, instead of creating a, a scenario where in those tough times we turned against each other, we actually held on tighter to one another and, and attacked the problem together. And that was how I knew that I wasn't letting him go <laughs> and that he was going to be mine for forever um, was because I, I knew that he wouldn't abandon me or he wouldn't turn against me in tough times. And that's really what the foundation of a family is and and if you can come together with your partner or your spouse or whoever and really set that example for your children um, when you're communicating with your partner or when you're communicating with your children then i i can tell you from years of experience that you will have such a beautiful home even when you're going through crap and even when there's conflict it's really, right. really beautiful thing to watch. So I, I see Christopher wrote in the tra chat room, I think that Stefan Mullen, you said that uh, the most exciting and challenging thing is, uh, is that he, when, he does, when he tries to reason with a four-year-old, right? <laughs> That's so true. that actually sparked something um, while Jessica was, was talking just now. And um, there's, there's something that I do a lot that I'm trying to work on still, and um, that's trying to reason against emotions, which is actually a fallacy in itself, right? So if somebody starts a, a, a something saying, uh, "I feel like this," you can't I'll try to apply logical fallacies then to or or logic to try to um, refute their feelings. So what you need to do is you need to put your emotions hat on, and uh, you try to get back to reason because that's where constructive dialogue can happen. But if your partner or your child, like if your child's flipping out. Whoa! you know sitting there and trying to reason with him is just is not <laughs> constructive however being with the child will um, psychically they'll experience that you're on the same page with them and they can cry it out or if your wife is uh, on her is you know yeah, about, about yeah. The PMS <laughs> and she's uh, you know freaking out or your husband is is flipping out because yeah, he's hungry ahead. you can you can put on your emotion hat and just be with them or try to transcend it you don't even need to use reason to do that or you can use reason for prudent judgment right which is what a lot of people that are stuck in reason don't forget about is that really it's how to predict the future to get the kind of outcome that you want you can say hey we're working in emotions right now like if i want to make this worse i can drop uh, fallacy bombs or um, i can try to disprove what they're experiencing even though that's a, fall a fallacy in itself um, you can transcend it and you can be with um, you can work on wearing different hats uh, there's like this six hat or something technique I don't want to speak on because I'm just starting to learn about it. But there's it a way you can really, get on the really, same page. It works really, really well with younger children. Yes. When they don't have the words to um, to really tell you what they're feeling, just to be with them and, and love them and be with them. Um, I've noticed that there's been a lot of times with our five-year-old who is really strong-willed. Um, it diffuses the situation when he knows that he's important, when he knows that we're, that we're caring about his feelings, even though he can't necessarily communicate what it is. That or when he's out of his mind, when he's out of his mind yeah. completely, because he's just so tired that anything you say, he's going to argue against. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, okay, so let's, let's move on. So also being conscious is um, being uh, clear on, on what, let's see here, what do you have? Clear. Oh, yes being clear on what you're creating in your home. So uh, my wife always tells the kids that creation is the spark of life, and I think that's beautiful. Um, so if you're, if you're in a creative state of mind, like an entrepreneurial state of mind, or you have goals as a family, you can, you can actually, um, it creates such a, a more uh, positive environment in the home, and you can be consciously 
moving forward rather than when you're in the trivialities of, of every day, um, it, you become kind of, you become, you become reactive to, to survival mode and you become reactive and you just kind of moving from goal to goal to goal to goal or maybe you don't even have goals and you're just flying by the seat of your pants yeah, or whatever. Your day. So being clear on purpose and setting goals with your family, letting your children in on those goals and uh, creating it together. And if you're, if you're not a parent yet, then when you're creating with your spouse, it's super sexy, you know, like, or you're creating with your partner, it's really, really hot to see uh, you actually, um, I see a link there. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 there's just something that happens. There's passions that arise when you're being creative in the home. So that's part of the whole being conscious. Part of, um, part of our transition, and this is kind of like a little side note, is um, I read a study where um, they were saying that the things that we have in our home actually uh, cause emotions to come out. So if you have an, a painting that was in your home when there was a death in the family, then you could possibly be putting um, some emotional trauma onto that painting. So they, uh, in this study, they said, you know, you should, you should really take stock in your surroundings and maybe change up your life. And that was also another thing, just as a side note, that um, we did when we were trying to remove contradictions and create um, a conscious causal existence was um, I just went room by room and if anything that I, I really felt really good about when I looked at it stayed and if it didn't um, you know have this reaction then I then I took it out and I started painting my walls with weird art and having the kids do you know finger paints and all these things that we put up on the wall to to actually have our home reflect what we were trying to create, which was happiness, joy, bright, you know, colors and, and fun things that we had found um, on walks and things like that. So that's just a side note. And I think that it was actually really, really effective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we kind of get caught up in the everyday and we're like, okay, our house has been the same way and we've had the furniture the same way. And um, what was it? Anna, Anna Martin, was she the one that that said that she, you know she, ever so often she just totally reduce redoes her house and it, it doesn't have anything to do with this is the dining room and we will eat in here you know there's bookshelves everywhere and it's whatever that family whatever her family is trying to create so I, I think that that your environment that you surround yourself with has a lot to do with how the people in your home feel as well. Right. And um, all so why I like conscious um, parenting or being conscious in your home or living consciously rather than just saying love is because people have such strange definitions of love. Some people think that pain, inflicting pain on somebody is love. Some people think that shaming, public shaming or uh, using like hate speech like in public areas representing the Christian church is love. Like you can call love anything and it's kind of uh, it's something that you, you it, everybody loves their partners, everybody loves their children, and it's not helping them at all. Like, I think that everybody really wants to do their best, and everybody's kind of trying to do their best. So um, those, the, the being conscious uh, is a way to transmit love as a verb, like you're doing it, right? You're actively committed, committing to being your best self, and you're actively committing uh, to, to bringing out the best in your child, and the best in your partner, and best in yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's the doing love. Um, as as an action, as something you can you can sort of measure, and uh, you know when you're messing up, right? And just to talk a little bit about more about the conscious part of it, um, the way that you can really check in with that is is being aware of the words that you choose and being aware of the um, of the activities or the things that you choose to do around your partner or your or your children. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is um, when I would get in my head and I would be doing like dishes or something like that, um, my, my daughter would come up to me and go, Mom, are you okay? You look really upset. And I realized that while I'm doing dishes, I'm going through some like <laughs> drama filled like conversation with somebody who didn't even have anything to do with, with what I was trying to create. It, it, it was just a way to, to bring me down. So to be conscious was like, okay, I'm going to choose to fill my mind 
with beautiful, positive thoughts. And I'm going to choose to have the words that I say be beautiful and positive. Um, and it took a lot of, of effort. It took a lot of effort. I think that, that, you know, maybe not everybody grows up this way, but I, I feel like I grew up in kind of a, a negative home. And so that transmitted into my adult life. And it took a lot of effort for me to wake up every morning and go, okay, today I'm going to create positivity and I'm going to say nice things to people and I'm going to create a world that I want to live in instead of just kind of drudging through my day. Um, so it, it really does take uh, awareness in every moment, but after a while, it kind of becomes like second nature. So even though it, it is a pillar and it can be difficult to live consciously, it, it can be achieved as well. It's kind of like creating a habit. And after a while, it just becomes second nature. So the, the, next, um, the next pillar or foundation, which is sort of second to consciousness, um, is, is courage, right? So it takes a tremendous amount of courage to do and create your family and do things your way. Uh, a lot of times when we're uh, sort of living in apathy, we don't care, or we think that we're tired or we don't have time, um, I've noticed that personally when I start going into that place of uh, sort of mediocrity or just, or just not living uh, with a clear intention, I've realized it's because I'm living in a sort of fear. Right, so I'm I'm living in cowardice when I'm living with contradictions, and I know that the contradictions are there. I call that cowardice, right? And it's it's a harsh word, but it it, it really just cuts deep. It cuts right through the BS. And uh, one thing that uh, in in our experience of of waking up and becoming conscious was that uh, inner growth and and having the courage to or. Um, basically unplugging and bringing the children home or even thinking about bringing the children home from school was brought up a lot of <laughs> insecurities. Like, I'm not smart enough to, you know, homeschool my children or there's no way that we can do this. Like, the way our kids act when they come home, like, we just can't handle them or um, we would just come up with all these different things. And uh, and I realized, and both and both Jessica and I realized that it was it was cowardice. There were excuses uh, coming up from our fear, and when we when we looked in head and took it head on together, we um, decided that we were going to support each other in um, in in becoming courageous or being um, people of character. And we listened to a speech recent. Well, it was it was kind of like in the middle of that uh, transformation. And uh, we listened to a speech from Lawrence Reed at a, at a, at a uh, Students for Liberty conference. And he does this amazing speech, which I'm sure many of you heard uh, about character. And, and uh, he takes men and women through history. And he shows just the kind of what they were up against. And they had so much more on the line. Uh, and, they, and they fought for liberty anyway. Uh, they fought for a cause bigger than themselves. And even risking death or imprisonment. Some, some, a couple was in prison for, you know, a, a long time. And then when they got out, they were back doing the same thing that, that got them in prison. And, uh, and we looked at each other and we were like, dude, life is too short. And when we die, like, do we either want to be completely forgotten by our children or do we want the conversations to be like, or, or our grandchildren, or, or do we want them to look back at us and go, man, those people had character. Those people were courageous. And, and have an example of courage, right? And um, so diversity, being, doing things your way, you're going to come up against uh, massive, uh, uh, what is it called? Like on, resistance, uh, resistance on Facebook, like, your family may, yeah. may have problems with you. And what are you, well, how are you raising my grandchildren? And, and uh, luckily my, my, uh, my mom is really supportive of what we're doing, but her family, not at all. And a lot of the people that we know that have decided to do things their way, their family is completely pushing against them, separating from them, friends, and, and just the mainstream. And, and you, you may find yourself going, dude, like, I don't want to hurt my children. This is like their lives are at stake here or their, their well-being is at stake and I don't want to fail them. So it comes down to trusting yourself, having the courage to trust yourself, having the courage to go, you know what? I have clear principles. What a gift that is. What a gift it is that I 
have come to the libertarian philosophy that I am uh, on a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on a path to ridding my mind of contradictions and my life of contradictions and, and basically extending the amount of, of goodwill and, uh, um, like when you see somebody else that's doing that, you'll compliment them and you feel like, wow, this person is badass. This person, you know, is my hero for doing this. But a lot of times it's hard to extend that to yourself, you know, and, uh, and so that takes a lot of courage, trusting yourself, trusting your partner, supporting your partner and going, look, these children are our children. And, and the fact is, is that we, um, we know what's best for them. Mm -hmm. And, the, and, and we know what kind of world we want to create. We want to create a free world, right? And we want to create the type of individual that's going to flourish in a free world or that's good enough for liberty, as Larry, as Larry Reed talks about. That's somebody that's going to be in integrity, that's going to honor their contracts, that's going to be self-governing. The type of individuals needed for liberty to work or for liberty to be achieved someday. And, um, and so we moved into courage. And mainstream parenting um, really at least in my experience, doesn't support those characteristics in children. Um, one of the, I was talking with Justin earlier today. One of the, the main catalysts um, to my decision of, of taking this big step and ch completely changing our lives around, um, we had had an opportunity to go back to California where we're originally from. And I was out walking the streets of Ventura with his mother and I was enjoying the scenery. It was very beautiful. But I noticed that all the people were asleep and they were kind of gray looking. And it, it seemed almost surreal that no one was smiling and everyone had their head down. And, and it just was really sad. And I had like this insane panic attack because I realized in that moment that the way that I was raising my children um, I was I was molding them into that type of an individual, somebody who just had their head down and went through the motions because that's what I told you to do. And um, I, I didn't want that. So that was like the big jumping off point. I wanted to raise sovereign uh, individuals who questioned, who were curious, who loved life and kept their head up and wanted to see everything there was to see. and and learn everything there was to learn. And at that point, thankfully, we had caught, I believe we caught it at a pretty good moment because they were just mm -hmm. starting to fall asleep. Um, and, and we were able to really work on that and to get them to have that love of learning again and, and to be alive and thrive and not just exist. And that's what I saw around me. I saw a bunch of people who were existing and they weren't alive. And, and I wanted to create not only a world where everyone was free, but a world where everybody was living and you feel it, you feel that vibe of, of aliveness, if that's even a word, uh, around you when, when you're surrounded by people who are doing things and they're, they're happy and they, they're creating. The feeling that something. you get at a, at a conference with, yeah. <laughs> at a Liberty conference, right? <laughs> right. Or a conference of people that are, that are doing their own businesses. There's, a, there's an energy that you get and and it feels really good and I wanted to create I wanted to create a, a an environment where my children knew that that was the norm and not the exception right. um, so that was a really big eye-opening experience so we've been speaking for about 45 minutes and I, I kind of want to end um, uh, this introduction and then open it up for uh, Q&A but I, I have one last message and and it's something that uh, I think it changed my life, and maybe you're already there, and uh, maybe if not, you can kind of reflect on it. But uh, there, courage is so huge, and the biggest thing to apply courage to is being wrong. Like, it's completely okay and actually uh, beautiful to be wrong and have the courage to admit that you're wrong and have the courage to expose the fact that you're wrong and put yourself out there even for people to criticize, especially your family. And if you can, if you have the courage, I, I probably close the door to a huge intellectual experience and a, a much larger worldview because I spent so many years being terrified of being wrong or being exposed for being wrong. And when I opened my mind 
and I saw just the incredible amount of human achievement out there, I realized, you know what? I'll, I'm an infant. Even with everything that I know now, I'm an infant compared to to the magnitude and volume of uh, of uh, hu human creation in terms of just the philosophy that's out there and the sciences that are out there and, and, and my intellectual pursuit that I'm totally committed to, I'll probably die an infant. And we have such a small amount of time here on this planet that if we can just get over being wrong, we can immediately start inviting people for ridding our, like helping us rid ourselves of contradictions that we're not even aware of. And, uh, and I've realized it's, make, it's made it easier seeing and opening my mind to how big the world is. I've realized it's okay. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to make mistakes. Um, even in libertarianism, uh, it, we, don't, we don't say that the non-aggression principle is some kind of physical law that you can't break. We go, look, the non-aggression is something, a principle, something that we can talk about because even in a perfectly free and ideal world, uh, there's going to be, we're going to be breaking the non-aggression principle probably as much as we follow it. It's just uh, being a good person is going, okay, I, I messed up, so let's, uh, let's, let me stand judgment and let me make you whole again. And even if I didn't mess up, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to put myself in a place where there can be a mediator that I trust. And if I'm found guilty for something that I actually didn't do, you know what? Uh, then I'm going, to pay, I'm going to pay restitution anyway because I'm, going, I'm committed to justice. I'm committed to, um, to uh, basically... I'm committed to growth. I'm committed to love. I'm committed to um, learning. And, and maybe I found myself in a situation that I should not have created, and I'm not going to do that again, right? So I just wanted to end it there. And, um, and if that's OK, if, if, if we can end yeah. it there. Yeah. OK. And, uh, just one more thing um, on top of that is when you come from a place of being OK to be wrong and admitting that you're wrong, um, at least in our personal experience, I've noticed a, a huge shift in our children. Um, they're not afraid of doing things and trying new things because they've noticed that we've started to go, okay, my bad, I, I was wrong in that and I apologize. And they, we haven't instilled that fear of being wrong in them. And so there's this whole huge wide world open to them um, and, and we've just broadened their ability to have a, a bigger worldview. So Absolutely. it's really exciting. And we mess up, and I mess up on that all the time. And that is something I think I'll have to commit to for the rest of my life. But it's, it's opened my heart, and it's opened my mind tremendously. Making mistakes is the only chance that that's the trend. That's where wisdom kind of enters. It, that's where inter, it slides through the cracks. The cracks are the mistakes that you make. So create more cracks like <laughs> it's okay so I'm gonna open it up so Matt maybe you can uh, take the reins here and help me uh, open up a dialogue if there is one hi guys thank you so much all right our first question is uh, from Frank Markopoulos he asks how are you finding living in liberal Austin since you're libertarians well um, Hmm. Do I answer this like a smart ass or do I? <laughs> so, um, That's funny. I love Austin. I think that uh, there's an amazing liberty community here. I'm so inspired by the people that I've come to meet here. And um, I couldn't imagine a, a better place um, to have my family. Uh, the only thing that's really horrible about Austin is the police. The Austin Police Department are, um, they're militarized, and they're probably the, the scariest police department in the country. So I, uh, we actually live on out, right outside of Austin, and I don't have plans on moving to Austin specifically because I am terrified of, of the police and what they're doing there. But uh, as a community, it's amazing. I, um, I, I'd like to interject something as well. One of the things that... Um, that Justin and I actually are trying to teach the kids, sort of by example, it's a lot harder to do, but um, when, you, when you can connect with somebody on the things that you have in common and um, that, you, that you love, uh, we're both members of, a, of an organization called Texans for Accountable Government, um, and they create action, uh, one action coalition, single action, single action coalitions, coalitions where, where people from across the political spectrum come together because they agree on one um, particular um, issue. And when you can do that with an individual, like say you come up to somebody and you realize that 
that they're maybe more liberal than you are. So focus on the things that you agree on and and you can create bonds and friendships um, that way. And it's it's a really good way to live. It's very positive. Um, and then and then when you have those friendships around the things that you love, then you can um, then you can set an example on the other things and maybe bring more people to liberty. Cool. We can go to the next question. All right, uh, Travis McCurry wants to come on air to ask a question. I think Travis just asked one, right? Was that from Travis? Yes, right here. Um, so there's there's also one from uh, I want to hear from Travis too, but I don't want to overlook Natasha. She uh, she just asked a question, but go ahead, Travis. Uh, the question I'm more interested in is how did you get started with homeschooling? What obstacles did you have to overcome, and how did you get started? Okay. So for us, um, we had we had learned um, that that there's a a good opportunity to kind of reconnect with the children and start fresh by doing something called de-schooling, um, where you kind of almost do like a summer break, allow the children to get their bearings, to be more of an individual, and that's kind of where we started. Thankfully, in Texas, there's not a lot of laws um, that hinder homeschooling. You just kind of have to sign um, this intent saying, we're going to homeschool our children, and. And thankfully, we live in a in a area where it's not really difficult. So I captured that question in, in um, the book, and it, it's it it kind of goes through the process of how we started homeschooling, and it went from as soon as I brought the kids home, we had a plan. Okay, we were going to de-school, like we were just going to let them be who they are, live in extremes, kind of get out the school, work out the school environment. And as soon as they came home, I freaked out. And I, I uh, was like, oh my gosh, I have to hurry. I can't fail my children, right? So I, I, read, um, I read The Well-Trained Mind. And, uh, and, and I, I created a classical education uh, curriculum, and I immediately put the children on that curriculum. And so I immediately brought school home. Uh, so I, I kind of went against our, our plan, which was to get rid of school altogether, even if it's a superior school model. I didn't want to, um, I, I don't want to create a curriculum and put them all in a box, right? So they resisted it, and, and we fought, you know, if we fought for a while and it didn't work, even though what we were doing was a lot more constructive than what they were doing in school, it, there was still a disconnect, and they were looking at me like the teacher that was going to punish them. So we had to go through months and months of months of let, leaving them alone and actually going, you know what, this is, we're going to treat this as a summer break, but on the other side of it, it's not school. On the other side of it, it's, okay, now what? Now what are we going to do? And um, the, the, start, the real starting point was when, we've, when we came to terms with the, to the fact that the children weren't the children. We're not going to school the children. The children are individuals, and they learn completely differently and have mm -hmm. completely different passions and completely different motivations. And uh, once we could bring out the best in them, um, the if they could come to mastery there, as long as we were teaching them skills, um, that they they would get their uh, general education more organically rather than shoving facts down their throat, which they're gonna forget anyway. So um, that was that was the real starting point. Mm -hmm. And now we've realized that um, my older son is kind of a young scholar and he wants to be a historian. And so we focus more on reading and discussions and experiences. And I try to place him in the company of the smartest people that I know. And there's a lot here in Austin. And he stayed with a, you know, a couple of intellectuals and uh, and he's having conversations and developing individual um um, uh, relationships with those individuals, and that's leading to a very an amazing depth of knowledge that I didn't I didn't know was possible at his age. My daughter is the artist, and she's the the athlete. And um, when I was trying to be a pedagogue to her, and and tried trying to um, kind of give my own agenda of, of 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 being scholarly, she hated it. She doesn't want if you if she senses that you're trying to teach her something, you're the enemy to her. And a lot of that is from her public school um, experience. But when I when I conceded and I was like, look, you win, I love you and and I, I'm not gonna treat you like you're broken anymore. Like I, I I'm I'm the one failing you and let's figure out where you're at. And a lot of it was she just wants to throw the ball with me. 
you know, and she has spent all of her time becoming a, an amazing softball player, and she's an all-star now, and she's being asked to be on select teams, which, like, are a gateway right into college on teams that are very difficult to get onto because she's put herself out there, and now her level of um, confidence has gone up, like, so oh much. God. She's a badass, and now we can actually have conversations, and she's more open, and so we're kind of getting there. We're she realizes that I don't have an agenda. I'm not trying to change her or treat her like she's broken or an empty vessel that I'm trying to fill. So, um, and, and she's an artist. So we're going a completely different path with her, and I'm learning to love her for who she is and be on the same page. And it's difficult for me, but it comes down to courage again. And then the little one's probably going to enter a sort of Montessori or whole life learning program, and then we'll see how how he does there and mix with homeschooling. He's just in that soak up everything around you. And he wants to phase. go to school. <laughs> Daddy, I want to go to school. Daddy, I want to go to school. So um, that's that's kind of where we're at. We're trying to see who he is right now. Nice. Thank, Thank you, you Travis. Uh, Natasha says that she thinks her uh, question on uh, on unschooling was kind of answered. Uh, so she's wondering, uh, what do you think of punishment? So um, there is a psychological discipline um, uh, called like operant conditioning. And it's uh, what schools have kind of been built on. And it's it's been uh, transmitted to them through behavioral psychologists. I think like B.F. Skinner and like those those people that kind of deny the existence of the soul and in children and and look at the children as kind of like these automaton robot sort of things so they so what what they've come to realize is that you can actually um, train uh, children in behavior modification by uh, rewarding um, the things that you want more from them and punishing the things that you want less from them so punishment is on the side that it's it's a detrimental thing to do as well as as kind of rewarding things that um, are not achievements, rather behaviors that you want more from. So uh, re rewards and punishments can be detrimental if they're not authentic. Um, but however, punishments, there, are, there is a place <clears throat> for punishments in the way that there is a place for punishments as an adult. Um, if you do I things... I would say it's more consequences. Consequences, not punishments, right? Um, uh, so there's no like... Uh, Maybe some people think there's a godhead or something punishing them or like karmic law punishing them, but I don't believe that. What, what I think is there's just natural consequences. So um, when you're personally responsible, you have liberty as an adult, okay? So if you're doing, if you're, if you're doing the things you need to, if your actions line up with your needs and you have a lot more choices and the, and the, the more you flourish, the more choices you have. Well, the same thing with a child. The more a child can self-govern, the more autonomous they, they become, the more personally responsible they are, mm -hmm. the more um, choices they have, the more freedom is extended to them. So if they start doing things that um, show us, uh, of our children start doing things that, that demonstrate that they can't take care of themselves, their freedoms um, kind of expand and contract as a response to that. So um, uh, I wouldn't call it a punishment, though I guess it could look like a punishment because it's not, it's not a perfect natural consequence. Um, because natural consequences are something that happens to adults. You can say, like, look, uh, you know, you could have had the sleepover, but you haven't met your responsibilities. You're not integrity, and you're not in integrity with your responsibilities. And that, you know, that's just not, you don't have those liberties, right? Or you can, if you're staying up all night, every single night, and you're sleeping until three in the morning and you're depressed because you're not creating anything, or you become slothful and you're just kind of walking around and, and uh, you know your teeth are rotting out, and you're just being kind of uh, dumb and not responsible with your actions. Then hey, you know lights out at, at midnight. Uh, I know that you that you're kind of more nocturnal than we are, but you're you're suffering from this, and you're not showing me, and you're not showing mom that that you're taking care of yourself. So we're going to help you because our job as parents is to keep you safe. That's objectively the job of parents, and that's the place of parents. And sometimes parents have to intervene. That's why they're parents. But the goal of parenting is to liberate the child. So if the rules of the home aren't creating harmony and the rules of the home are, are kind of arbitrary and like, you know, benefiting the parents at the expense of the child and you're using punishment to condition them uh, or you're using these, you're calling them natural consequences, but they're really punishments and it's hurting them 
whatever, then you're doing something wrong. But sometimes rules, as I as I talked about in the book, can actually bring you closer to with mm-hmm. your children. And and for instance, like my son started giving me his phone at night and going, look, I don't trust myself with electronics at night. I keep myself up and then I feel bad in the morning, so I'm going to give you my electronics. And then sometimes I just ask for them or I turn them off or I turn the internet off. And I'm like, look, you know, these corporations, they put billions into holding your attention. I can't expect you as a child to fight against that, to have intellectual defenses against that. So I'm going to intervene and and I'm going to help you here. But my goal and my intention and Jessica's goal and intention is to liberate them. So I'm not a full radical unschooler that like thinks that children are perfectly autonomous when they're born. I think that's crap. Maybe some are, but mine aren't. And But I want them to be fully liberated and autonomous. I already call my 14-year-old a man and I give he can pretty much do whatever he wants now. But if he messes up and he reverts, something happens and he goes through a phase where he's not autonomous anymore, he's not, he's not personally responsible, as long as he's my, uh, he's in my home and, and I sense that he, I still need to be parent to him, then consequences will happen. But if, as soon as he is fully autonomous and, and, and paying rent on his own place, then our, our, our uh, parenting dynamic I, it changes. We become friends and uh, maybe a place of wisdom rather than, rather than uh, dishing out natural consequences. And I think a thing that was obvious in what Justin was saying was um, communication is really where all that happens. We talk to the kids about, even, even our five-year-old, we, we communicate very uh as clearly as we possibly can what's happening what happened that we think needs to be uh, corrected where they weren't um keeping up their end of of their responsibilities and why they're not you know able to have uh, enjoyed this freedom so um i'm I'm sure that you all got that but communication is really um the bottom line when you're dealing with consequences and in the book i i have a discipline section and i i think i boil it down to um it's better to treat discipline as an adjective rather than a verb. So like when we talk about people that get what they want, it's usually discipline is like a positive thing. Wow, that person's really disciplined. He, you know, he led that business to success or became an Olympic gold medalist or that sort of thing. But when we talk about um, uh, disciplining or to discipline a child, it's usually has to do with pain and mm-hmm. punishment. And, and I, I think that somehow that was lost in translation, some kind of social thing that started it emerged and that became the norm and and i'm i'm fully against that sort of thing all right our next question is from chris putnam um he asks was there a point where your kids realized that you were raising them in a non-traditional way and how did they respond it was pretty much right away um when we had decided to shift our household we sat them down um, and we had just a full disclosure. Um, I, I apologized to my, my two oldest. I, there was a few instances um, when we were um, you know, traditional parents that I had spanked them. And I, in that moment, I took the opportunity to apologize and, and to ask for forgiveness and to say that we were going to create something entirely new um, together. And they, I mean, they were like shocked. <laughs> the look on their face was like, is this real? We're like, we have input in our, in our house. We have input in how we're going to be raised. Like we, we were very much um, interested in what they wanted and what they wanted their life to look like. And, and um, it was, it was pretty crazy at first, right? Because right. it just well, we, kind of happened. We um, we we apologized and we said things were going to change, but we didn't have a clear trajectory ourselves. Right. So, um, what we started doing was changing things, and they were kind of confused and they didn't know yeah. how to react to it, how the dynamic changed, and like they were so constrained, they were imprisoned by their day that we were creating for them by the school and all that sort of thing. So when we let them out of the cage, they acted like freaking animals and they, um, their behavior was out of whack yeah. and they were, uh, there was, they were out of balance and that sort of thing. And, um, and we were like, Oh my God, what are we doing? And, 
And so as this de-schooling, de-schooling process happened, we actually went, wait a minute, we actually never had a full-blown conversation with why we're doing this, what our motives are, what we're trying to create. So there was a series of conversations and they started getting it more. Mm-hmm. And uh, it literally, it was, I mean, it, it was like, a, it's been about, it, I would say it was a year process before we could find our new groove, before we could create something new. And we tried a bunch of different things. Um, like Justin said earlier, one of the, things that we got into that really hurt our our uh, growth process and made it kind of more sluggish at first was we lumped the children in as one group. So everything that we tried maybe worked for Mikey, but didn't work for Allie, or it worked for Al and it didn't work for Mikey. And it was really um, difficult. But once we kind of hit that, oh, they're, they're individuals, that really um, catapulted, you know, everything that we were trying to do. Um, but it took us. It took a series of trial coming, and error. Yeah, coming we had together to make a lot and like, of okay, we we goofed on that mm-hmm. one. Now let's try this other thing, or or asking for their input as to what it was that they that they wanted to learn, or how how they wanted their day to look. Mm-hmm. Um, and we tried to tailor it in with what they what they were thinking would be good for them. And we're still trying to figure it out, right? So like the kids change so much, and they're so different, and we're changing, and so. Yeah. It's like it. I think the course correction is just going to happen until they grow up. I've I've come to realize that the trial and error is just going to happen until they're grown up, and we're just going to constantly be changing and shifting depending on what they want, how their uh, motivations are changing, and the conversations, the communication is just like, as Jessica said, absolutely key. Is there any more questions? Uh, yeah, we have a. One more here. Um, Chris Putnam asks, how do you guys talk to your kids about sex and drugs? Fully, completely, openly. <laughs> I would say probably maybe maybe a little too open. <laughs> so um, we, we are uh, full disclosure. We Anything they want to know. We're real they with them. Um, we don't pull any punches, but um, I'm not saying that that's going to work for every family. Yeah. And it ought not to. Every family should be different, right? But uh, I, I think the best scenario would be to be completely open and then create a. So we've created a. Um, we've created a state where. So the the dynamic changes. For instance, like when the children are really little, they're not asking about sex, or when they do, like you kind of sugarcoat it, and they develop. So our, our conversation has changed. Um, but with our older son, it's like we're talking to another adult. And uh, we, don't, we don't try to create false realities in their mind. That's, that's what we're trying to avoid. That's what we're trying to um, get away from. With drugs and sex, we talk, about, we talk about the virtues and vices of both. You know, there are good drugs. There are things that drugs can do that are great for you. And there are things that drugs can do that are horrible for you. And it's about being personally responsible comes down to being personally responsible Uh, anything really in moderation is okay Uh, you may you may find it uh, something that you don't want to get near and I advise that these certain drugs you don't get near but if you do um, you know I trust you and I think that uh, you can self-govern and I think that you'll know what's best when the time when the time comes and then with my daughter I realized that our relationship has changed around sex like before you know she was a little girl and and maybe even being naked in front of me like she didn't even think oh I'm naked I I watched her go from being a little girl to being a young lady and she started developing and wanting privacy and I respect that and certain things we can talk about and certain things she leaves to her mother because our our dynamic has changed she's a young lady now and she's she's become a sexual being and so I like there are certain things that I can't get near because it's it's sort of inappropriate or I notice that it doesn't work um, but I'm all about fl- full disclosure. Yeah. I'm all about being real with it and not when, trying to, 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 to lie to our children that we've never touched them or that we only had sex when we were married and all that crap. So. <laughs> and and um, something that I've done is in when they come and talk to me or ask me questions, um, I give them like so much information that it's almost like they're like, okay, mom, you can stop now. And I'm like, look, there's going to be a time in your life where you're going to probably want to know this stuff or you're going to need to know this stuff, but we didn't have an opportunity to have this discussion. So 
I'm sorry if it's too much for you and it's cool. Uh, you know, put that away for another time and trust me, you're going to want it later. Christopher, your question here in the chat is actually like something so relevant to where we're at right now. Um, so we're fighting for marijuana legalization and we're taking the children to events like Texas Normal events and like certain things um, where that is that is totally talked about. Mm -hmm. And we've realized that um, CPS and the state is using marijuana as an excuse to break families apart. So we have this dialogue and we say, look, <clears throat> if you talk to your friends about um, our openness to marijuana and that we're fighting for it, they may go to their parents and say, you know what, you're so mean. Um, my friend, you know, is talking about how their parent, you know, my friend's parents are totally cool with it and maybe make up a lie like we smoke together, which we don't. Um, we don't even smoke marijuana in the house, but uh, we're, we're so sympathetic to it and, and think it's so good for people in, in terms of medically and just if people want to do it, they want to do it, that they, that thing can happen and the CPS can come to our door and try to break up our family. So we tell them we're very real about the consequences of speak, uh, being open to their friends about this or uh, authorities, state authorities about this because they want any excuse they can to come in and break a homeschool family apart mm -hmm. or any excuse they can to break a family apart in general. Um, if, if drugs are there, it's like the green light. So we talk to them about that and there's that balance where we have to go, look, we're open, but that doesn't mean you can just go speak with your friends about this and you absolutely can be taken away from us and it's happening all the time and cops are breaking family door down and, and even killing people and killing parents in front of their children. This is a real thing. It's happening all the time. Um, about around freaking marijuana. So look, yeah. this is very serious and because even how we live, we can be scrutinized. So we, we're just very real, like who, these are the enemies. You know, the state actors are the enemies to the family. And, uh, and this is a very real thing. So I really appreciate your question, uh, question, Chris, because this is something we're dealing with right now. Yeah, we've talked a lot about that, especially with the kids. Um, it's, it's difficult, you know, you kind of have almost like this double standard, but it's very important to, to make that clear that, you know, in your home, um, especially with our oldest, we're like, in our home, you're safe. You're, you can be yourself. You can talk about whatever you want, but you need to understand that people outside the home may not believe the same things. And, and that's a real threat. So yeah. you need to be cautious about the, state, the words that you choose. The state is far more a threat to families than, than bad actors are. I mean, it, like families are getting ruined and destroyed all the time. And I can tell you one thing, that if the CPS came to my door and they threatened to take my children, I would leave. I, I, would, I would get the hell out of town because that terrifies me. Even though I have nothing to hide, like risking my children being lost to stand on principle to fight the state, it's just, um, it's not worth it to me. Like the state terrifies me <laughs> when it comes to families. I have too much to lose now. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, that it's been really great. I'm I was homeschooled myself, so I'm hearing a lot of you know stuff my parents dealt with uh, in here. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, we've got a great lineup uh, this week and this whole month uh, here at Liberty Me U. Tomorrow night we've got a debate between uh, Stefan uh, Kinsella and Alexander Baker on the question of IP, and Jeffrey Tucker is going to be moderating. That should be very entertaining. Definitely uh, check that out tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, we've also got three more uh, three more talks in this series on parenting and homeschooling here in uh, in July. Uh, our next one is with Terry Moore, who's the author of The Secular Homeschooler, which is available for Liberty Me members uh, for the month of July. Uh, that's uh, July 16th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we've also got a talk by Laurette Lynn, uh, who is known as the Unplugged Mom, I believe. Uh, that's going to be coming up on July 20th. And then uh, we've got the Libertarian Homeschooler, Anna Martin, on July 28th. Uh, she's awesome. If you haven't heard her, definitely uh, check that out as well. And remember to check out uh, the guide that Justin wrote, uh, Free Your Children. I, I linked to it in the chat a bit earlier. You can find it on Liberty Me. And then uh, 
check out Terry Moore's book, The Secular Homeschooler. Thank you again, everyone, for coming in. Thank you guys so much. Uh, it was very in enjoyable and informative. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening.